most current agricultural systems are always trying to get rid of the water in the springtime and then they don't have enough water in the fall. And so we want to create a different relationship with how we harvest the snow in the springtime and how we make that water available in the fall, changing the dynamic and the relationship that we have with water. Today we're installing a pond on this property. In this video, I'm gonna talk about all the benefits of water harvesting on properties and how it benefits the land regeneration process. In this ecosystem, roughly half the water we get on an annual basis comes from snowmelt. And so this pond is our solution to capture that snowmelt because when the snow is melting in the springtime, the ground is frozen rock solid, meaning that the water cannot infiltrate. And so we collect it in basins like this so that we can use it later in the season as it gets dry in the summertime. This pond collects roughly five acres of snow melt further up on the property. And we'll talk about how that water gets into this pond. Water is one of the most important elements in the design of any regenerative property, which is why we design it first. When we're designing a property, every element on the property either wants water or doesn't want it. For example, buildings typically don't like to sit in water unless it's a boat. And trees and gardens and pastures want a certain amount of water, but if they have too much, they will die. And so we can use water as the master layer on a property design to delineate where things like roads, structures, fences, food forests, pastures, gardens, and any agricultural system should go based upon where the water flows. Now, because nature bats last, when we don't account for how water moves through a system, we typically pay the price in destruction. So water can both create life, but it can also take it away. We've all seen what happens when there isn't enough water, we get desertification. And we've also seen what happens when there's too much water, we get floods, destruction, and sometimes even death. So it's really important that we get the water layer right and that we design all the other elements on a property around that water layer. When we're designing a property, we start by understanding the climate. So what kind of climatic zone are you in? Then we look at the geography. So what's the geomorphology of the land? What's its shape? And how does it interact with the climate? And then from there, we understand how water moves from one part of the property to the next. The water layer then informs what kind of water harvesting features, if any, are required. Things like ponds, swales, key line design, terraces, and any of the other water harvesting tools that we have in our toolbox. Once we understand the water layer, then we figure out where access goes. And so access are things like farm tracks, high grade roads, footpaths, quad paths, and anything else that we use to traverse around the landscape. Access is one of those layers that doesn't want to be wet. And in fact, when Australia was first being developed, they actually looked at where the sheep walked through the landscape in order to figure out where to put roads because sheep don't like wet feet. And so wherever the sheep walked, the land was dry. So in general, we use a framework which starts with climate, geography, water, access, and finally structures. And so structures are things like buildings, sheds, hay storage, anything that we're actually physically building some sort of a structure that is going to have some function on the property. And typically we want those structures to be in high and dry locations. Once we have our structures figured out, then we can figure out things like fencing, flora, fauna, um, and all of the other elements that goes into a land regeneration project. This pond was especially special because when we started digging it, we actually found an enormous amount of shale underground. Now shale can be used as a road building material and it can be very expensive to bring aggregates in in order to build roads. And so we had to build a road on this particular property. And so it just turned out that while we were able to build a structure to harvest water, we were also able to get all the materials that we required to build the roads, which saved us an enormous amount of money. So we got two benefits for the price of one. Today I wanna to go through some of the main points that you need to consider when you're designing a pond so that it's safe, efficient, and effective. The first point to consider when you're designing a pond is to make sure that all the side walls are at a three to one or at most a two to one ratio, meaning that for every meter down, it goes out either three or two meters. And so you'll notice that this slope is actually pretty shallow. I can walk up and down it. And there's a few reasons for this. When farmers typically build dugouts, they typically go straight down in their construction style. And so that creates an unstable slope. When the water fills into it, as the water infiltrates into the sides, 
it ends up collapsing the slopes and creating a big mess to be totally honest with you. And so by having a three to one slope, as the water fills this pond up, this soil will remain relatively stable, reducing the amount of erosion. Now, the other thing that happens when you have a nice shallow slope is that if someone should fall into this pond, they'll have an easier opportunity to get out of the slope. This soil, when it gets wet, gets very, very slippery. And so you can imagine how hard it is when you get to the side of a pond, if you've got almost vertical sides, it's almost impossible to get out. Number two, we want vegetative benches. And so this vegetative bench is about a meter and a half wide. It's flat. And if you look behind me, we're covering it with topsoil. So there's two things that this does. Number one, if this vegetative bench is at the right depth in the pond, no more than a meter into the water, it'll allow reeds and other wetland plants to grow, which will help to stabilize the sides of the pond. Really important for the longevity of the pond. These plants also filter the water, which ensures that we have a cleaner pond in the long run. Number two, if again, you get stuck in a pond, having the ability to swim up to a flat bench and then pull on some plants will allow you to get out. So it's also a safety feature as well for this particular pond. You'll notice that we're putting topsoil on the back slope here, as well as on the top of the pond and behind the pond, in addition to the vegetative bench here. So this bench will allow the plants to take root and be healthy. And all the topsoil that we're putting onto the side slopes, the top and the back will allow us to grass these slopes up, which will reduce evaporation and hold the pond wall together. Another important factor in terms of placing a pond is making sure you have catchment, meaning that there's water that's actually gonna flow to where you're placing the pond. And so behind me is this culvert, and this culvert is connected to a series of ditches and various earthworks and land shaping that I've done on the top of my property. And so that represents roughly five acres of land and some of it's forest, some of it's garden, some of it is where our structures are located. And so when the snow accumulates through the winter, that snow then gets funneled from the, the roads that we've built into ditches. It gets accumulated in the forests. And when that all melts, it all will come out in this culvert right here, which then ends up in the pond, which is behind the camera over there. So it's really important when you're doing your design and your analysis that we figure out approximately how much water is going to come through here and how often it's going to come. Like it may not come every single year. Some years we have great melts and some years we have really poor melts so that you can assess how likely it is for this pond to fill. Now, the other resource we have on our property is a creek. And so that creek has massive swells of water that occur during that melt as well. And so during a spring melt, we could theoretically get a license and pull water from that creek to help fill this pond up. So making sure you've got good catchment is a really important thing to consider before you build any ponds. Another important factor when you're considering the design of a pond is making sure you've got the right soils. So you wanna make sure you've got at least 50% of the subsoil as clay. And so there's different ways that you can test that. You can do a jar test if you don't know what that is. Basically you take some soil clumps, put it into some water with a drop of soap and see how the different soil fractions come out of the jar. So basically sand will come out first in the jar and then silt and then clay. And so you measure the total column of soil and from there you can calculate what percentage of the subsoil is clay, sand and silt. If you don't want to do the jar test, and you wanna be a bit more scientific, you can send soil away to a lab and have them do a texture analysis and they'll give you a very accurate percentage of sand, silt and clay in your subsoils. The other really important thing to consider is that if you don't have enough clay, then you can always bring some bentonite clay in. So bentonite is a, a really sticky clay that is naturally occurring that can help to seal the pores and make up the difference if you don't have 50% clay in the mix. And that can be a very effective way to seal your pond. There's also bentonite impregnated liners and, and various other materials that you can use to seal your pond. If these ponds that we're building, there's another one that's not in the, the frame right now, don't seal, one of the techniques that we want to try is something called glaying. And so we actually want to put some pigs and possibly some cows down the bottom of this pond and we'll actually feed them down there and create a little bit of a feedlot, which sounds horrible, but the manuring and the decaying organic matter that will accumulate in the bottom of this pond will actually create a glay layer, which is essentially an anaerobic biofilm 
That's the result of the decomposition of organic matter, which will seal those particles. And so you have a variety of different options available to you to help seal your pond. But having a good understanding on the front end of what materials you're starting with is very important. If you want to get updates as we produce content like this on our channel, make sure you hit the subscribe button. In addition, we write a weekly email that goes out that's all about global land regeneration called The Shift. And I'll also leave a link on how you can subscribe to that newsletter. If you're interested in exploring these ideas on your property, water harvesting, land regeneration, food and anti-fragile infrastructure, book a free call and we can talk about some of your goals and whether or not Fifth World can help and we can explore what this could look like in your life or on your property. Okay, we'll see you guys in the next video.